you are listening to the Music Ed Mentor Podcast, where we teach music educators how to build, manage, and grow thriving school music programs and have long and happy careers. I am your host, Elisa Jansen Jones, and I'm happy to say that I've had a wonderful last few weeks presenting at multiple state professional development conferences. Thank you so much for all of you who came up to me and, and met me and thanked me for the podcast. Thank you for attending my sessions. And those of you who just made the entire experience so incredibly rad. In fact, if you attended any PD conferences at all recently, I'd love your help. I've created a collaborative blog post at musicedmentor.com. Just go to musicedmentor.com and click on blog. You'll see the collaborative post and here's what I'd love for you to do. Just enter into the comments one major takeaway from your recent professional development experiences. Let's share all the best parts of these things with each other. This episode is one that I have so been looking forward to sharing with you. My guest is Director of Culture and Strategic Leadership for the Texas Elementary Principals and Supervisors Association. He has also served as an award-winning principal of a pre-K-5 grade campus of over 775 students in rural Texas. He's been recognized by the White House, John Maxwell, the Center for Digital Education, National School Board Association, and the BAMIs, and more for his work in education and with children. Todd's first book, Kids Deserve It, which was co-written with Adam Welcome, was a runaway smash. And since then, he's authored Stories from the Web and co-authored Sparks in the Dark with Travis Crowder. He's also hosts the podcast Tell Your Story and is very active on social media under the moniker Tech Ninja Todd. He is passionate about doing whatever it takes for our students and helping others tell their story. His name is Todd Nesloni, and he's going to be dragged over the coals on behalf of all music educators who have had issues with our admin. Don't worry, he takes it pretty well. I ask him all the questions that keep coming up for music educators, like why aren't admins supportive when they very well know the importance of music education for their students? How can we bring up difficult conversations with them without wanting to pull our hair out? How do we approach them without feeling super stressed? Why do they keep sending us emails that say, come talk to me? You know what I'm saying? Do they have any idea how stressful that is? Todd will help us come to a better understanding of how to work with our administrators and also perhaps help us feel more validated in the process. This is going to be so good. But first, you know this podcast is supported by Smart Music. Smart Music works to make your life as a music educator easier, from tracking practice to recording performance tests to encouraging your students to practice, developing sight reading materials, inputting your own music, and fun play-along tracks. Smart Music has the platform you need to simplify the context of your music teaching so you can focus more on the content that matters the students. Learn all about the tools that Smart Music has for you by going to smartmusic.com. While you're there, be sure to subscribe to their blog and get great content from music educators who know, and to access all of the show notes for this podcast. The show notes for today's episode will include links to all of the things that Todd and I mentioned, so check that out too. This podcast is also supported by the World Choir Festival and Clinic, a virtual experience for choirs around the world. Simply record and submit a video for your choral group to be streamed live as part of the festival day. It's that easy. There's also a full day of choral-specific professional development workshops. They're 100% relevant, practical, and actionable, and accessible. That entire day of professional development is just $19. Or if you have a choir signed up, it's totally free. Learn more at musiceducationsummit.org. Now, let's hear what an award-winning principal has to say about working with music educators. So uh, my name, of course, is Todd Nesloni. I have served for seven years as a teacher 
five years as an elementary principal. And in July of this last year, I just started my brand new job as the Director of Culture and Strategic Leadership for the Texas Elementary Principal and Supervisors Association, also known as TEPSA. So now I get to work with school leaders from across the state, as well as I've written a couple books, including um, Kids Deserve It, which was a big hit. And I do a lot of travel across the United States and in Canada presenting and sharing ideas and resources and encouragement, inspiration, um, because our job as educators is tough. And the more we can get people in there that give us great ideas that are truly about the kids and the ways we can make things better for the kids without overloading ourselves, um, I think is the better. And so I've had got to have a lot of neat experiences outside of education with meeting President Barack Obama um, and a couple other neat things. And so it's been it's been a fun ride. Well, I'm so, so glad to have you here on the Music Ed Mentor podcast with us. And are you telling me that non-music teachers have a hard time as well? It's not just us. That's right. It is all of us. And it's funny because sometimes when we are just stuck within the four walls of our school, we can begin to feel really isolated or feel really like we're the only ones going through things. And even if we're like, as far as music teachers, even if you're only connecting with other music teachers in your district or at meetings or conferences, it's still very limited with the way you grow and connect. And so for me, social media and being able to connect with people from all over the world helped me find my group, helped me find my people and let me know I wasn't alone. And now traveling and presenting and meeting educators from all over the United States in person, you see how prevalent these overwhelmed, stressed out, and anxiety-ridden teachers are and how many of them feel like they're the only ones going through it. Because when I talk about these things in my presentations, afterwards, people will come up and say, thank you for saying that. And I just get lost in this, Is nobody ever told them all these things. Like, I need people in their lives to fill these holes for them so they don't feel so alone. <laughs> it's it's so true. And that's something that we as music educators really struggle with is that feeling of isolation. For example, I was the only music teacher in my school. My school was a private Catholic school. So the other music teachers in the area, elementary music teachers specifically, they all would meet once or twice a month, but it was always on their early out day, which I didn't have the early out day. So they were meeting while I was still teaching. So even though I had a great desire to go, I I couldn't. And I was so isolated. Like my classroom was the back of the stage you know, and, and there are three buildings. And so the other classrooms are in the other buildings. I was the only classroom in that building, unless you counted the gym classroom, which I did. Jim's a class. I love Jim. Um, <laughs> not, not anyone named Jim. Okay, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, so that this isolation thing, but you're saying that we should be actively seeking to unisolate ourselves? Yeah, and you know, I think being a principal... I have a unique connection and understanding to what you're talking about because as a principal, you're the only one on campus. Mm -hmm. And even though I interact with all of the staff and the kids and the parents, my position is still very isolating as well um, because I have to carry a weight and a load that I can't always share with other staff members. And I only get to meet with other principals if there's a principal meeting or there's so many things going on. And when I think about what you just shared from a music teacher perspective and a music educator, you know, I think sometimes the rest of the staff can forget how isolating your position is. Because when you are a classroom teacher, you are so caught up in your own world that you think you know what's happening around campus. But when you take on a different role on that campus, you realize, oh, I had no idea what was happening on my campus. And so when I think about our physical education teachers or art or music or any of those or librarian where they're the only one. Yeah. You interact with the teachers in the hall and when you pick their kids up and, and all that kind of stuff, but it's like, you have to plan on your own. You have to be creative on your own. And like you said, maybe there's opportunities to have other music teachers that you can meet with, but maybe it doesn't work out that way. And that's where for me, social media was that game changer. It allowed me the time when I had the time to connect with others and it tore down all those walls of, is this person approachable? Should I even be reaching out? Like, I don't feel worthy of reaching out to this person. They're doing all these amazing things. It's like, well, if they're on social media, 
they literally want to connect with others. That's the whole point of being on social media. So reach out. The worst thing they're going to say is, I don't want to talk to you, or they won't say anything at all. And what's the loss there? Okay, fine. I'll move on to somebody else who wants to collaborate or help me out or be part of my crew. Yeah, that's true. We we really have to be the ones to take the steps. We can't be waiting for other people to come and find us. I am a social person. I mean, I'm kind of one of those people who I'm very happy alone. I I would be called an introvert, but I can be an extrovert. You know what I mean? Um, I've always made an effort, especially when I was teaching middle school. And again, I was way back in the back of the school teaching band and orchestra. And I insisted on having lunch in the lunchroom with my colleagues where we had, you know, a faculty room and that was kind of the thing. And that's how I got to know them. And that's how I got to collaborate with them. And it was nice to have them so close. And when sometimes I needed a brain break on my prep period, I would go and visit with them. And at this current school, or, you know, my, my most recent former school, I would do the same thing. I'd go visit them at lunch, I'd attend meetings, I'd make sure I knew what everybody else was doing and let them know what I was doing, so that they could uh, collaborate with me as well. If we isolate ourselves with communications as well, then we're 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 just as big a culprit as the people who are forgetting about us, like you said. Yeah, and you know, some educators are really lucky to work at a school with administration who does different things to bring the staff together, who allows them to get to know each other outside of their content areas and their grade levels. But what I've found is many educators do not work on a school like that. Every meeting is overrun with data and curriculum, and there's no time to get to know the people. And so I think exactly what you said, you know, I, what a lot of people don't know or believe about me is that I'm an introvert as well. And in large crowds, I can bring out an extroverted side, but it's very exhausting. And the moment I'm done with the conversation, it's like, I need to go in a dark room with a bottle of water, light music, like don't talk to me for an hour and then I'll be personable again. But I'd probably need a nap somewhere in there too, because peopling is hard (laughs) for me. And so, and it's so funny because I travel and present in people all the time and they're like, I, well, I, I don't believe that. And I'm like, trust me, I sleep on every plane ride. I don't talk to anybody when I'm driving in the car. Like I have all this refuel time set up in my schedule. But I think what you said about being a music educator and being the only one on the campus, if you want to insulate yourself and, and protect your heart and your, um, your creativity and protect your energy, you have to get out there. You have to find ways to go to lunch with some teachers, go sit in the staff workroom. If you have one of my, uh, my sister-in-law is an art teacher at at the campus I used to work at. And one of the things she used to do is if she had some time off and had some available time, she would go into a classroom and just hang out with kids or ask a teacher, can I just come in and like read a book and just get to spend some time? Because she wanted to start building those relationships with the educators because you're already building it with the kids. You see all the kids, you connect with them. But like I said earlier, the teachers, you just see them passing. And so you've got to put yourself out there, no matter how uncomfortable or exhausting it is. Otherwise, you will isolate more and more and more and more. I'm so glad that you are that way as well, because <laughs> I, too, am exo- I, I love people. I love my colleagues. I love going to conferences. And I'm so, so looking forward to it. But I do need that time to recharge. And, you know, people don't believe that what I it is truly exhausting and and not for a bad reason it's exhausting like running a triathlon you know it's a wonderful fun thing that I love to do but it's also I need that time to recharge too well you know and and it's one of those hard things to explain to people that aren't like that because in the moment they see you like full of energy and personable Mm -hmm. and you're like yeah because I'm really working at this right now but (laughs) I'm doing it because, you know, us as educators, we're like used car salesmen. Like we have to bring up the energy and and sell the instruction and all these kind of things. And and when you're in conversations, you want people to like you. Well, they don't like a bump on a log. So you got to bring the energy. And it's like, I'm good right now, but I'm nearing my limit. So I may step away here in a minute just to stop talking. But right now we're good kind of thing. Nice. And I think that a lot of our listeners are probably going to connect with that some kind of level of that feeling as well. So I guess when it comes to feeling isolated, know your needs, know where you are, and then take the responsibility to be the one to fulfill your needs. Is that what our administration would appreciate from us? 
You know, I don't know if it's necessarily your administration would appreciate. I think it's what you, what is necessary to have longevity in this career. Um, this career is so unlike many others, and there's so many factors that come into play. And what I find is the longer we exist in education, the more rules and laws and things that come up to make our job even more complicated and less enjoyable. And so whatever we can do to insulate and protect our hearts and protect our attitudes, the better so that we can bring the best every day for kids. Because, you know, what an, what an administrator wants, or at least what I wanted, was people who loved kids. Because I always said, I can teach somebody how to teach. I can't teach you how to love kids. And if you don't love kids, especially elementary please go work somewhere else because I ain't got time to deal with all the parent phone calls about how their child is too traumatized to come into your class. I love that. So speaking of being supportive, that's another big complaint that I hear from other music teachers is my admin isn't supportive. And like to the point where they will change jobs midway through the year if they don't feel supportive. So my first question is, why aren't administrators supportive of their music teachers? You know, I don't think it is unique to music. I think it, it is more unique to the arts and to librarians and positions like that. And I really attribute it to administrators who have not educated themselves well over the importance of arts and literature. Um, when I think about that, and I don't say that as a diss, what I learned when I became a principal is the people above a principal expect the principal to know everything about everything. Like you need to know curriculum for every grade level and subject area. You need to know your data. You need to have your attendance rates. You need to have your discipline down. You need to deal with teachers who aren't showing up on time. And I think administrators get so bogged down in that, that all their focus and energy goes into that area because that truly is where their job is dependent. And sometimes administrators can create this mindset of it's just music class. Like do your thing. I don't care. Like leave me alone. Do your thing. I've got the more important things. And I think the best thing our arts educators can do is to show the value of arts education and how it affects the big picture. And so for me, I understood that our music education, our art education, we had a maker space, our library time, like those were protected times on my campus. I always told teachers, you will never pull a kid out of an arts education class at this school ever. I don't care if they need extra tutoring. I don't care if they're in trouble. They will not miss the arts. And the reason is, is because I know I was one of those kids that school was hard sometimes. And if all you're doing is drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling into those kids and, and all you're focused on is the academics and they're underperforming, so we got to put them in all these special groups and they never feel successful when educators don't like to talk about this, but the reality is college isn't for everybody and that's okay. But you know what? We would not have some of these incredible things we have in our world and our country if not for the arts. And so letting a kid grow and explore their creative sides outside of the rigorous educational environment of the classroom is important. And our ed ed administrators need to know and understand this. And, you know, when you think about the things that parents come to, they don't come to an academic night. They love coming to the Christmas concert or they love coming to the art show that their kids did. It's like, because they understand too, like, these are kids. And when I say kids, I mean 18 and below. A kid is a kid is a kid. I don't care if you're dealing with a 17-year-old in a music class or a four-year-old in a music class. They're all still kids. And, you know, I always tell people all the time, you know, adults are just big kids. The only difference is we cry way more than our students ever do. And so when I think about how music educators specifically can get more support from their administrators, educate them. And not in a rude way, like, hey, you're an idiot. Look how important this is. Um, but let them see that what you're doing, the work you're doing on that campus, positively impacts everyone on that campus. 
there is no negative impact to an arts education classroom. None. And administrators don't have to add anything extra to their plate to support the arts. And that's what's important to bring up too, like letting them know, I don't need you to like come in here. I don't need you to go and, and create something like, give me the money, give me the resources, give me the time. We're good. Like, and I think for me, it was all about, I didn't have to spend any extra time on the arts. I just told my arts teachers, just like I told all the rest of my educators, do what's best for kids. Like I will 100% support you as long as you are not breaking the law or hurting anybody go for it and I will be your biggest cheerleader. And when people feel empowered to take control of their area and know they're going to have their support if they fall and make a mistake, everything changes. And I wonder if some of it's our perception too, because one of the complaints is like my principal or the admin or whoever didn't come to our concert. Now I had a principal who was wonderful and specifically told me like when I went in and said, well, what, what, what do you want us to learn in music class? And he said, I don't care what they learn. I want them to love music. Some of those kids, music will be the reason they come to school. That is the thing that they will come to school for. They will tolerate the rest, but they will love it. And that is what I want you to do. And I happen to put on good programs. And yes, they learned a lot of wonderful musical skills. And yes, I hope that I taught them to love music. So he was an extremely supportive principal. And when when we needed new instruments, he was you know, able to facilitate granting for us and and stuff like that. He even wrote the grants for us. It was amazing. But he didn't come to every concert, you know. And when I invited the assistant principal to come in and participate in a kindergarten lesson plan where they were making these cute little instruments and it was going to be so adorable, and she didn't come. But I still felt supported. So do you think that part of it is our own perception of what support should look like versus what support actually is? You know, I think there are several correct answers to that question. I think the first thing that educators in general, one thing I learned when I became an administrator was that I had no idea what an administrator day looks like. And I thought I did. And the moment I got in that position, I was like, whoa, the things they're doing and the the fires they're putting out and the phone calls and the unexpected happenings. I had no idea all that was going on because I was so insulated by my administration and never had to worry about it. So I think the first thing is understanding that sometimes your administrators do want to be there, but other factors pop up that don't allow them to. Because a 15-minute parent conversation can turn into three to four hours very quickly in a principal's office because that parent doesn't care about what they have to do because they know there are no kids in their classroom. They could take up all their time. And so that's one. The second thing I would say is oftentimes I hear educators complain, and this is just educators in general, about never seeing their administrator. They're not ever in my classroom. They don't come to my things. And my first response is always the same. Have you invited them? And I loved hearing you said that you had because many times educators haven't invited the administration in and they just want to complain that they're not there. And I'm like, no, some need that invitation. Like they need to feel like you want them there and know that one or two invitations don't count as inviting them in. Because like I said, unexpected things happen that they can't always legally explain to you. So invite them multiple times, even if they don't show up the first or second. And then if they don't show up after like the 30th invite, then yeah, they suck. And maybe it's time to work somewhere else. And and you need to know that. Um, But I think the other thing too is, you know, like you said, just because they don't show up doesn't mean they don't support. Um, Sometimes it does. I don't want to say that about everyone. But just knowing that one thing that I really heavily utilized as an educator and even as a principal, when I wanted to convince my superintendent or my school board of something, I use the kids. And that is your most powerful weapon as an educator is so have your kids create an invitation to take to your administration. Have your kids make a little video inviting just your administrator Take a group of kids up to the office and have them beg them to come tonight to the program because it's really easy to say no to a 41-year-old. It's a lot harder to say no to an adorable six-year-old who's begging you to come to their program. And so I always use my kids for things like that. I love the manipulative side of you, Todd. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so here's another bone that music educators have with principals. Why do why do why are we given such a rigorous schedule? 
I mean, I had I had three straight days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I was eight to three, almost constantly with classes, no transition period. In fact, when I started teaching, there there was no transition period at all between elementary classes. So kindergarten was waiting outside the door while I was still finishing my first grade lesson because there was no buffer period. And those teachers were so ready for their prep time. So they were ready to get rid of their kids. And, you know, they... The other ones were coming late. And again, no time in between. And the bathroom was 10 steps from my classroom and I couldn't use it. You know, so why do they give us such rigorous schedules? You know, and that was the same on our campus. We had a five minute uh, buffer in between each class. And my specials teachers saw about 160 kids a day. And it was constant. And it was a group, a group, a group, a group, a group, lunch break planning time, a group, a group, a group, a group, a group, all the way to the end of the day. And I would get, I would have constant conversations with my specials teachers of, okay, talk to us before you do the master schedule, because I cannot have a fifth grade group and then a kindergarten group right after them. I don't have time to switch up everything in that five minute block. I need us to have some kind of like, I can go kinder to second, but I can't go kinder to fifth. And so like things like that. And we would talk. And the reality is, I think for me, the reason we made that decision or those decisions is a state law. State law requires that students get so much of certain times every week. And the only way I had a campus of almost 800 kids, the only way I could get 800 kids seen correctly by state law was to have a schedule like that because I couldn't get funding for additional positions. Now, if there were additional positions, maybe I could work it out. Because one thing that I did as a principal is when I took over, there were four specials rotations. um, And that was putting 30 to 40 kids in a group. And that was really hard for my specials teachers. And we were legally within our rights to do that. But I knew that that wasn't what was best. So I put in another specials rotation, a fifth one. And so we could break up the groups where they were never larger than 20 kids. And so even though I couldn't give them more time, I was trying to give them more space to breathe so that they could have less kids in the room because that can be an issue too. But it really is all about staffing and what your district will give you. And, you know, when I see campuses that still are blessed to have a librarian and a music teacher and an art teacher, I'm just at a full time one at that. And then even better, a certified one at that. I mean, it's all about working with what we're given and knowing that sometimes we just can't change it right now and and we can make it work and we can try our best. And it is and, you know, one thing I've been really working with educators lately is understanding it is okay to say this school isn't right for me this position isn't right for me, this career isn't right for me, like whatever. Because I think sometimes we get caught up in this mindset of this is the best it's going to get. And I love kids. So I have to stay here and deal with it, whether that's a toxic person, whether that's a toxic schedule, whether that is a toxic um, district that you're working in. And we think we have to stick there forever because the kids need me. and, And this is my passion. And what you find is if you don't take care of you, you're good to no one. And so I tell educators every time I present now, like, it is okay to say, I'm going to go work somewhere else. And you can't say I'm staying here because of the kids, because literally every school has kids and every kid needs an adult and you are not Jesus and you are not going to be their savior and, and, and make everything better for them. Um, But you have to take care of you and whatever that looks like for you, you have to take ownership of that. And it is okay to sit there and say, no, I'm going to put me first and my mental health and my stability first right now. Everybody needs to hear that. Everybody, especially teachers, because we get, I think we, the teaching profession really attracts givers mm-hmm. and to some extent martyrs. Yes. And we, we want to give 100%. And I don't think we have to give 100% all the time, constantly to everybody. And it's my, not sustainable. Exactly. And my big thing recently is we think of self-care as something we do now and then when mm-hmm. really self-care is constant. We need to constantly be looking at where am I, how am I feeling, and nurturing our own needs throughout the day constantly. So anyway, that this is this is another we'll we'll get there. 
I have another question though. So we have this rigorous schedule. Now we understand why we have this rigorous schedule because you don't have enough staffing and maybe they there are mandates that the principals feel like we have to meet. So how do we go to our principal and say, this is too much and this is why? What are the approaches that we can practically use so that they don't just look at us and go, well, everybody has it that busy? Mm-hmm. You know, that's a great question. And one of the things I always told my fam- my school family was that I want to hear your complaints and I want you to come and tell me, but I always want you to come with a possible solution. The worst thing an administrator deals with is people who complain because what you find as an administrator is literally that is your full day. The teachers are complaining. The parents are complaining. Central office is complaining. And you're like, oh, my gosh, I, which one do I put out first? Because all you hear are complaints. And so then when somebody on campus comes to me and they're like, this is unacceptable. I'm not going to be able to maintain this. My response is, what do you want me to do? Like, I've got so many things right now. I understand you're stressed out, but did you bring any ideas? Okay, well, then I'm just going to set this to the side right now because I have other people who are bringing ideas that we can move forward and find a solution for. You're just wallowing in your self-pity. And so for me, it's very much of a go to your administrator and express your concerns. Do not hold them in, but express them and say, hey, you know, this is really overwhelming. I'm having a really hard time keeping up with this. I had some ideas. They may not work, but maybe it's a starting point for us to look at. Can we look at some of these changes? Because many times the first idea is never the right one. But at least you get your brain thinking and at least your administrator knows, oh, they really want to make things better. They don't just want to sit here and complain because there's a difference because if you've been in education for any amount of time. You've worked with somebody who only wants to complain. Okay. This is awesome, by the way. I'm loving this. What do we do if we go to our administration and we say, my schedule needs these breaks and we present an alternative schedule? Are there any administrators out there who just don't care, who just don't want to help us? And how would we recognize that? (laughs) Are there? Yes. That's like saying, are there teachers out there who don't care? Yes. There is always somebody on a campus who is there just to collect a paycheck. And, you know, sometimes as educators, we like to live in this fantasy dream world that we're all there for the kids. It's not true. There are people there who are there just to collect a paycheck and nothing else or just to have medical insurance and nothing else. And so, um, yes, you will have administrators who just don't care and who just tell you, sorry, can't do anything. Go figure it out. And they truly mean that. Like they truly don't even want to try to find a solution. And so I think there's several things to think about here. And one of them is know your administrator and and judge them well. Because at times, maybe an administrator comes back and says, my hands are tied. I really can't do any changes right now. And that's a perfect time for you to say, well, is it okay with you if I prepare something to present in front of the school board at the next school board meeting? Like not as a diss against the principal, but as a, hey, school district, We could really use some support here and always bring kids with you. Again, I repeat that because I said that earlier too. bring kids to school board meeting because the school board is going to be a lot friendlier when you got a little six, eight, 12 year olds there with you to talk about your needs. And so sometimes, though, and you got to be careful the way you say it, because you don't want an administrator thinking, oh, you're going to go to school board and complain about me. No, now I'm going to get you even harder. Like you got to be real manipulative. I guess is the right word and and not in a bad way, manipulative. Like you hopefully know your administrator well enough where you know their emotional state and how they react to news and ideas and things like that. And so work around it and think about it. And then if you've really got a jerk administrator where you're like, I'll bring an idea, but they're going to just throw it down, bring them the idea. Always don't ever skip that step. Always bring them the idea. If they throw it down right away and you know, because they're just a, heartless jerk that you can't even bring up school board meeting without them throwing a fit and coming after you then just go to the school board meeting. Don't even tell them, but don't ever talk poorly about your administrator, especially in a public setting because you are setting yourself up to be burned at the stake. So go to that school board meeting and do it in a positive way. 
I love so much being a music teacher in this district. My heart is here. The things we've got to do with my kids are incredible. Look at this music program we were able to do. Look at this band concert I was able to do. Our kids love it. I wanted to give you a couple minutes to hear from a couple of my kids of how much they're enjoying the arts. Let the kids share and then be like, but I'm really struggling with the way our schedules are at all of our campuses and how we, we're, the district doesn't provide enough resources. And so I come to you today just to tell you, I love being here, but I need support and help. Can you help me figure out how to do that? If you are not the right person to go to, let me know where I need to go. But I just want to bring it to your attention, the great work we're doing and ways we could use more support. People will listen to that. People shut out the complainers. Mm. I love that. It's something that I cover in a lot of the presentations I do at conferences. Stay positive. Mm -hmm. Because people don't, when you're negative and you're the one, wait, I have to say that a different way. Um, when you're the one, <laughs> I love when it. you are the one complaining about things, you're only going to attract other complainers, mm -hmm. people who like to complain about things because they think it's okay with you to complain about things. Mm -hmm. So always stay positive, even if other people are negative, and you will draw to yourself the positive people, and you will come across as somebody who's pleasant and happy and, and are willing to work. You can say negative things in a positive way. Anyway. I think something too to, to mention too that ties into that is there's a difference between venting and complaining. And I think when you need to vent, you need to have a set of people in your life who do not work at the school. Do not vent to your coworkers. That is not the correct place because that is complaining because it's going to become a big complain fest. And so have a group of people that on the regular you can reach out to and say, I just need to just vent and get this out of my system right now. And then I'm good to go. And so I think it's important to remember that too. Hmm. Awesome. So here's my next question for you as a principal. Why do administrators only focus on the negative? Why do I only hear from them when there's a parent complaint or a student complaint? Like they aren't praising this amazing unit I just did on instruments where I brought in all these instruments and players and, and we made instruments and it was this amazing thing. And the program that we put on was amazing. But the one thing I hear about is the one thing I said wrong three weeks ago in a class of second graders. Why did they have to be like that? So I want to try and explain an answer to this. And I don't want it to hear, don't want it to come across as an excuse at any point because there is no excuse for that. And that's the truth. Um, but administrators deal with a lot on their daily basis. And 90% of it is negative and complaints. And so they feel like they're always putting out fires. And sometimes for staff, that can feel like, too, like all we ever hear is negative. And an administrator, a good one, has to know that there's a balancing act, that you have to do more uplift than you do putting out a fire. And so they have to be at that point to say, I have to make sure, like for me, it was I had on my calendar three days a week to write a note to somebody on the staff. And to go put it in their box and then or I would get little gifts for them or I would send an email or do a phone call home to one of their family members to tell them how great a job they're doing like little moments of appreciation and not always to recognize something big and so you have got to have an administrator who understands the importance of that you know and in all three of the books that I've written I talk about the importance of that because culture building is king and if you don't build a powerful culture but in understanding that too what I remind educators is it is the not the sole responsibility of the administrator to build the culture on the campus and to recognize others. And, and educators need to understand that because we all know that one angry cafeteria lady can ruin an entire year for a child. We know that one rude front desk receptionist can make those kids of that family never come back to that school again. And so we all play a role. And so if you really want to change the culture of your campus and, and start that, that building of thankfulness and, and recognition and things like that, it's always, how are you recognizing others? Did you go reach out to the third grade teacher who did this killer thing when you walked by? Did you congratulate the PE teacher for the way they line the kids up and write them a little note? Like, did you go give a hug to the cafeteria lady and say, we are so thankful for you. I'm so glad you're here every day. Like, 
all of us have to be building that in. And yes, it is difficult to bring yourself to do that if you're in a really negative, destructive environment where it doesn't ever feel like the administrator is. But I always remember that the easiest way to deal with a negative person is to drown them in encouragement because it's really hard to be hateful, negative, mean when everybody's telling you how great you are. And principals hear it the least. They don't ever hear what they're doing right. And so maybe if your administrator never recognizes anybody, maybe you can anonymously thank your administrator for something. Maybe you can write them a note, send them an email, leave a sticky note on their door. Like, Because I will tell you, as an administrator, I hardly ever heard anybody tell me what I was doing right. Or if I did, the moment I was feeling good about hearing that, six different emails or phone calls or text messages come in that take it away from me because you know how we are. We obsess about those negative things or how people think about us. And so I think we all need to have that mindset of uplifting others and pouring into others and not sit back and go, well, what have they done for me? Well, nobody's recognizing me. Well, nobody is this because the true research and science behind gratitude is that when you show gratitude to somebody else, it actually increases your mood more than the person you're showing gratitude to. So if you're having a rough day, build up others and you'll automatically see your day lift up as well. That is so true. And it only takes a few times of trying that to feel it and demonstrate that in your own self. So our dear listeners, take a moment to just text somebody a thank you really quick and just explore what that does to your body. (sighs) Okay. I think I have just one more big question. Okay. How do we make our administrators love us? We already covered being the ones to get out and, you know, get to know other people and network and and collaborate so that we don't feel isolated. We've talked about how to approach problems with our schedule or whatever our needs happen to be and how we should approach that with our admin. We've talked about support, but what can we physically do if we feel like our administration still, I've done all these things, they're still not supportive. What can we do? What is it the admin are looking for that we can give them so that they love us as a music teacher? I'll speak for me personally. Um, What I was always looking for was a teammate. Um, Somebody who will have my back as much as I have theirs. There's always people looking to bring an uh, administrator down a notch. And so naturally, we don't trust many people. Um, Administrators will tell you they trust their staff, but we're always leery of, did they call the school board president? Did they write something on Facebook? Did they tell a parent? Now that parent wrote something on Facebook about us. And when one of those things does happen behind your back as an administrator, you immediately pull away and you think, I can't trust any of them. Like I'm doing all this stuff to try to make this school work and they still hate me or they still are going against me or trying to bring something down and you take it very personally. And so for me, it was always like, I truly connected most deeply to those who in addition to sharing their needs were willing to stop and ask me of my own to say hey Mr. Nesloni how are you doing today no like how are you really doing is is there anything that I can do to better support and many times I would say I'm good no no everything's great and just leave that going I love they really cared like I really appreciate that I don't even need anything from them but to know that they've got my back, that's huge. Um, and use use your, some of your time each month to tell your administrator you're thankful. So when I was a classroom teacher, that was one thing I was really adamant about is as a class, we're going to tell somebody in a position of power, thank you every month. So maybe we all wrote letters to the superintendent. Maybe we made a little banner with our fingerprints on it and sent it to the school board. Maybe And it, and it wasn't a brown nosing thing. It was all about, I know you hear more bad than good. So I want you to know you've got somebody who works underneath you that really appreciates what you do. 
I don't agree with you every day. Sometimes you really get on my nerves and I've considered going to jail by choking you out, but I still like working here. And so um, I think if you want to build that relationship with your administrator, let them know you're on the same team. And, and, and that doesn't mean only fill them with fluff. Be real and honest. Nobody wants a yes man in their life all the time. Or at least I didn't. I wanted those honest people, but I want those honest people who do it from a place of love, not from a place of I've got you. Okay, I lied. I do have one more question. <laughs> How important is it for us to come with data to back up things that we're saying? Do administrators really, truly, because I've been saying that for years, because that's what my admin always appreciated. But how important is data to an administrator? I think you've got to know your administrator. Some administrators, data's king. And it's what the district's drilling down on them, and that's all they care about. So some administrators will not listen at all unless you have the data to back it up. Me personally, I was an administrator where the arts were in my heart. And so I was like, you don't have to bring me any data. Like, just tell me why it's what's best for kids. Oh, totally agree with you. Okay, yeah, let's do it. What do you need? How can I make this work? Like, appeal to your administrator, whether it's to their heart or to the numbers. Just figure out what works for them. Awesome. I think that's all the questions that I have. Did we did we cover things thoroughly enough? We covered a lot, so <laughs> I don't know. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Todd. And I'm going to email my former principal right now and just let him know that I truly did appreciate him. I have been so blessed to only work in schools with outstanding principals who gave me freedom enough that I needed and yet supported that freedom in a way that felt protective and put me in the leadership position. And I hope that all music teachers are so privileged to have principals like you and wonderful administrators. And if you don't, then maybe the next step is for you to go into administration and become one yourself. There you go. Awesome. Is there any final words you want to say? Uh, I guess the final thing I would say to the music educators who are listening is if you are working in a place where you don't feel valued, know that you are valued, that your administration or your team members or your teachers may not value you today and you may feel worthless on that campus and like nobody sees the joy you bring, but there are countless of us across the country who know how invaluable your position is. And when I look at the arts teachers, I look at them as lifesavers. Because just like you mentioned earlier, there are kids who the only reason they come to school is because of the arts. And I think of my music teacher that I got to work with for five years as a principal, who is one of my dearest friends. He is one of the most incredible people on the planet. And I could list 50 kids who look at him as their father, who struggled in every part of their day except when they went to him. Kids that that would not have felt successful without his class. And so my thing that I would leave all of you on is that your job matters no matter what anybody around you is saying, no matter what you may forget in the midst of the pain of feeling alone, is that you are making an impact oftentimes more powerful than even the classroom teachers. I totally agree with that. Because as music teachers, if we stay in the same school, we get the same kids year after mm -hmm. year after year. Yep. We are the ones who get to watch them grow. We don't have to pass them along to another teacher. That's the wonderful thing about being a you know K-8, K-12, K-5 kind of teacher. It's amazing. So thank you so much, Todd. This has been outstanding. Thank you for having me. It was a blast. I, I've never got to talk so specifically about music education, and I, I love this conversation today, so thank you. I told you that was super valuable. I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this episode. Remember, you can check out the show notes page at smartmusic.com slash blog or at musicedmentor.com to access all of the links and to sign up for Todd's email list. 
I've been on his list for months now, and it's one of the few emails I never forget to open because I enjoy it so much. Inspiration, motivation, application. You know what I'm saying? Thanks again to Smart Music for making this podcast happen and bringing it to you. Remember to check out the World Choir Festival and Clinic happening April 17th through 18th, 2020. Visit musiceducationsummit.org to learn more. Thank you for spending this time with me and for investing it in yourself. And until next time, my friend, stay inspired, stay vigilant, and keep teaching on. Yeah.